Chula works the puck in the corner. He's bringing it out. Go! Lavardier scores on the one timer from Chula. Hi, I'm Bill Clark with the Binghamton Whaler Table Hockey Club. And I'm Jared Jones at the Broom Duster Table Hockey Club. And we're here today to teach you guys about some U.S. history. So, off we go. Okay, first topic today, eh? Constitutional flexibility. Yeah. And there, that's right, there are, there are three main ways that the U.S. Constitution um, maintains its flexibility. And the first one is called the Elastic Clause. And the Elastic Clause was put into the Constitution to allow Congress, um, if you remember our, one of our previous lessons, um, Congress is your legislative branch, they make the laws, so the Elastic Clause will apply specifically to the, the Congress of the United States, and to the President to an extent too, because the President has to take part in that lawmaking um, process. But for the most part, the Elastic Clause is given to Congress, because Congress is what today is directly elected into office. So the Congress um, represents the people more than any other branch of the federal government. So the framers of the, the country felt um, best, I guess, at ease or most at ease with giving that ability to change or modify the Constitution, add to it as, it is, as needed, um, to Congress, if that makes any sense, if I've said it the right way. And there are two parts to the Elastic Clause which um, cannot be implemented without both of them being in place. In other words, if something is necessary, and, and there's probably a great number of things out there that, that the people of the country would say are necessary. That we, need, we need these. And Congress might even agree with that. But it also has to be proper. And, and that's the part that most people forget. Necessary and proper. The necessary, I believe, is probably the easiest of the two to fulfill. But proper is the key word here, the operative word. And what does proper mean? In this context, it means within the framework of what the founders of this country had in mind when they put the Constitution together. So it might be necessary for a, a percentage of the people to have in order to go about their daily routines, but if it's not proper, if it's not within the framework of what the founders thought of or intended when they devised the Constitution, then, then it does not meet the requirements as set forth by the Elastic Clause. So it, it it limits Congress that Congress can't just pass any law they want. They can only pass laws that are both necessary and proper. And yet, that offers a lot of elasticity, a lot of flexibility, a lot of stretch room, a lot of wiggle room. What they thought was necessary and proper in 1799 is not what we think is necessary and proper today. So there, it allows for flexibility. That's the key idea. And I think that's why you see with, the, with President Obama's health care plan why there are so many people that, that are both for it and so many people that are against it. Because it depends on how you define what proper is. I, I think that there's, without going too far, and please keep your, your hate mail to yourselves, there's probably a number of people out there that would, would, that would think that the health care plan is necessary for them. Maybe not for me, but maybe for them it is. Is it proper? That's the key question, and I'm certainly not going to even begin to answer that. Um, there are, suffice to say, a number of people that think it is proper, and there are a number of people out there that think it is, at the very least, anti-constitutional, meaning that it goes within the framework of what the founders had in mind when they put the Constitution together. And you can research that and figure out your own, uh, find your own philosophy in regards to the Elastic Clause. Um, but the Elastic Clause, necessary and proper, and as, as Mr. Jones said, as Indiana said, it allows for the federal government to, to roll with the, the current, chain, current times and uh, adjustments that are needed within what people think um, are necessary at the time. Awesome. So the Constitution allows the government to change its interpretation a little bit over time with this elastic clause. An even more concrete change is the amendment process. Guru, what can you tell us about the amendment process? First of all, it's very difficult to amend the Constitution. If we look back, um, the first 10 came with the Bill of Rights. And after that, there's only been 17. There's 27 total amendments. There have been 17 amendments in, in our nation's history. Again, the first 10 come with the Constitution, essentially come with the Constitution. 
Um, so it's very difficult to get the, the nation as a whole to agree. And it's not necessarily an entire, entire nation. It takes three quarters of all of the states. That's why we have two thirds and three quarters. Two thirds of Congress has to agree to amending or changing the United States Constitution. And if we forgot, or if I forgot to mention that, that's what we're going to start with right here. And, the, and so rarely, to, to meet your point, Guru, so rarely does two thirds of Congress agree on anything. So right there, this is difficult to amend the Constitution. Sure. Stop and think how different, if you've ever traveled around the country, stop and think how different Texas is from New York, or how different California is from New York, or even Florida from New York. So to get the states to agree on you know, some of these issues, certainly very difficult. Um, and, and, and we could talk more about um, some of those issues in another day, particularly the, the Reconstruction Amendments, because you might be asking, well, how did they get the Reconstruction Amendments passed when the southern states were, were all for slavery? Well, they were forced to, to agree to these things, or they wouldn't Special be admitted. Special circumstances. Special circumstances, exactly right. So very difficult to amend the Constitution, very, very difficult. Um, we've had 17 of them, very hard to do, um, not impossible, but very difficult. And yet, it can be amended. It may be hard, it may happen rarely, but it can be amended. We don't have to have a bloody revolution every time we want to change the Constitution. We can change it peacefully. Yeah, and that's, and Mr. Mr. Jones, Indiana, just hit it. Amendment means to change. So you're going to change the Constitution. Just for a little side note, there are more amendments dealing with voting than any other topic um, in, in, the, in the Constitutional Amendments. There have been four. Um, arguably five, depending on how you define the other, but certainly four amendments dealing with, with voting rights. Anything else on that one? I think we're good. Okay. The last, probably the most controversial of the three, is judicial review. Um, the framers didn't intend for the Supreme Court to have the ability to change the Constitution. Um, not at least the majority of the framers when they, when they did put the Constitution into place. Matter of fact, judicial review is not even written into the Constitution. This was something that just kind of, um, out of matter of circumstance, almost um, the Supreme Court adapted and took the opportunity to take greater authority. Um, Supreme Court Justice Chief, Chief Justice John Marshall, who was a Federalist, um, Federalist meaning wanting a stronger federal government, took the opportunity to institute something called judicial review. So judicial review uh, is a process where the Supreme Court picks and chooses what cases it wants to hear, and then makes rulings on them accordingly. And there have been a number of, of, of Supreme Court rulings, again, not picking sides or getting into the issues, but that are extremely controversial. Controversial meaning that the nation's, in, in large part, split on whether or not the Supreme Court has done the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, and this, this kind of segues into the constitutional issue of strict versus loose interpretation of the Constitution. If you are a strict interpreter of the Constitution and you're a Supreme Court member, then you are going to abide by what the Constitution says that you can do, and you're not going to read into it a whole lot. If you are a loose interpreter, then you believe you have greater latitude to make rulings based on what you may or may not think the framers had in mind, going back again to that word proper. So, Supreme Court rulings can be very, very controversial. Again, not getting into any of them. You can research them. We'll talk about them in class. And then you get to make up your own minds regarding whether or not you think the Supreme Court did the right or wrong thing. Highly controversial. So these justices on the Supreme Court, according to the power of judicial review, they have some flexibility to determine are the, uh, the actions of Congress and the actions of the President, are they meeting the Constitution? Are they Constitution, or are they unconstitutional? That gives them some flexibility to interpret the Constitution. It's all about flexibility. And these three examples of flexibility, the Elastic Clause, the Amendment Process, the Judicial Review, they're what helped the Constitution survive for as long as it survived, well over 200 years now. An incredible document that is still the government of our country, and now, thanks to this flexibility, the longest surviving written Constitution out there. Uh, by the way, nine Supreme Court justices. There are nine of them. They are all appointed by the president when there is a vacancy. They're there for life. So once they're appointed, the check and balance, by the way, comes in large part on the Supreme Court justices before they get picked. 
this, or excuse me, after they get picked, but not, not fully on the bench. So the president selects them. Then they go to confirmation hearings, where Congress will interview them and decide whether or not they're suitable for the position. If Congress agrees to them, they then take the bench. And they're there for life. The only way they can be removed is if they step down, or they die, or they're impeached. And it's kind of hard to impeach a Supreme Court Chief Justice because they know the law. Constitutional flexibility. <laughs>